Well, now to the mounting pressure on the FDA to fully approve coronavirus vaccines. With the Delta variant currently causing a spike in COVID cases, health officials saying it might prompt some of the unvaccinated to roll up their sleeves. So joining me now to talk about that process, Dr. Archana Chatterjee, who was on the voting board for the Pfizer vaccine. Dr. Chatterjee, thank you so much for being with us tonight. All right, so you previously voted no to approving the Pfizer vaccine. What do you think it's going to take? for the FDA to give that full approval? The FDA decides on whether to uh, give full approval licensure based on the data that are submitted by the sponsors. And uh, as a member of VRPAC, the committee that advises the FDA, we actually get to see those data that are submitted by the sponsors the, in a briefing document. And then the FDA also gives us a briefing document. And we decide based on those data whether we recommend to the FDA that the product be approved or not. The FDA is finally the one that makes the decision. Well, you know, why hasn't the FDA acted more quickly, especially when we, you know, consider how devastating this virus has been, you know, on America and on the world? Well, I would say that the FDA did act fairly quickly last year to use a mechanism, the emergency use authorization process, to make these vaccines available as quickly as it was deemed safe and effective to do so. In terms of the licensure, that depends on the decisions made by the FDA scientists on whether sufficient data have been submitted to approve the product or not. Well, and I think that, you know, that does concern people because thinking, well, whether or not sufficient data have been submitted to give that full approval. And then, you know, you have people who, who still are unsure about the vaccine and they say, well, you know, if the FDA doesn't have the sufficient data, why should I have this shot in my arm? Well, the requirements for uh, assuring safety and efficacy are very similar actually for authorization and for approval. It's just a little bit different process. Mm -hmm. So in terms of safety, I think the public needs to be reassured that the FDA has done its due diligence in assuring safety. And as you know, hundreds of millions of doses of these vaccines have now been given. So we have real world data to show that these vaccines are safe and effective. And, you know, and I think that's something that, I, you know, I personally come back to, you know, there have been hundreds of thousands of these given. Um, you know, the majority of people are fine. It obviously offers excellent protection. Do you think once the FDA does give that full approval, do you think that will change some people's minds? I certainly hope so. You know, there are some people, no matter how much information they have, it's not going to be good enough for them. But I think for some others, the actual approval by the FDA will perhaps make, their change their make them change their minds about getting the vaccine. Well, and going back to that, uh, you know, you, you originally voted no. What could you see? What do you need to see to then go ahead and give that yes vote? Yeah, the no vote was actually in December, on December 10th, so that's a long time ago. Yes. And the reason I voted no, I've explained it before, is that at the time, the amount of data that they had for children, um, 16 and 17 year olds, older adolescents, was very small. They had data only about a, on about 150 participants. We now have data from the clinical trials, as well as real world data on large tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of children. And so I would have no hesitancy in voting based on the data that are currently available, provided that they demonstrated continuing efficacy and safety. Well, you know, we're hearing from somebody on the board saying that, okay, let's talk about variants. We know Delta variant right now is raging. We know there are some cases of the Gamma variant here in Chicago. Are we going to just continue to see these variants, these mutations of the virus? Absolutely, Lincoln. I think this is something people need to understand that viruses mutate and this one mutates rapidly with the large, millions, hundreds of millions of people who are infected around the world, we're going to keep seeing these variants emerging. And the variants do become more resistant to vaccines, to treatments. So the faster we can get the largest number of people vaccinated and protected, the better off we are. And how, how likely do you think it is? You know, obviously the flu shot is offered every year. You know, sometimes people get it, sometimes they won't. Do you think that eventually the coronavirus vaccine will be similar to our annual flu shot? There's a very good chance that that will indeed happen. Um, you know, something that you mentioned the flu, people don't realize is we had a pandemic in 2009, the H1N1 pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. That influenza virus is actually still around and we include it in our current vaccines. 
So it's entirely possible, in fact, quite likely, in my opinion, that this virus is going to be around for many, many years and that we will likely need to continue to vaccinate against it. Dr. Archana Chatterjee, we so appreciate your expertise. Thank you for joining us in studio tonight.